Starship is getting danger close to T-minus zero as future passengers book their tickets. Elon continues to take heat for his good deeds. Tom Cruise pops back on our radar and we have some heavy updates to go over. I'm Kevin and this is SpaceX in the News. This video is not sponsored by Burnt Hair. It's just like leaning over the dinner table, but without all the hard work. Now, some of you may be thinking, since The Boring Company isn't a sponsor for this video, I'm just shilling for Elon so he can make huge gains for free speech. And you'd be right. Comment your fascist feels below. I am nourished by your hatred! After arriving at the launch site last week, Booster 7 was lifted onto the orbital launch mount this Monday. Short one of its center Raptor 2 engines, but don't worry, it was already on site and installed shortly after. Then after delays due to the chopsticks buffer pads being too thick for the hook and pins, Starship 24 was also lifted for stacking on its booster Tuesday evening, something we haven't seen in half a year, and SpaceX's own drone following up with some stills of the event. RGV aerial photography also sharing his take from 10,500 feet up. Cool brah. About 24 hours post-stack, she made it with the Starship quick disconnect arm, and SpaceX tested a simulated launch disconnect in real time. Afterwards, she was fisted by the arm a second time for some kind of proof testing that kept coming and going on Thursday. Elon has confirmed that it's expected the Mars rocket will be de-stacked within a week, followed sometime after by the first 33 engine booster static fire. The next time we witness a full stack of this beast will be for the first orbital launch, most likely in November. That is the sexiest thing I have ever seen. And as if that wasn't enough to quench your Starship thirst, SpaceX also announced they have booked the first two passengers of the second Starship trip around the moon. Dennis and Akiko Tito, a husband and wife pair who are both passionate about space and aviation. She has her pilot's license and he was the first commercial astronaut to visit the space station in 2001. I took part in the media brief where we were told by SpaceX's director of Starship Crew and Cargo Programs, Artie Matthews, why this is happening. This mission is really about expanding the accessibility of space travel to a much um, broader type of person that might be able to and want to go to the moon. Having a mission like this on our manifest expands what's possible. One of the ways that we can do this is by having airline-like operations. And this mission is another step towards that where you'll be able to buy your own ticket to the moon. This of course ultimately sets us on the path towards SpaceX goal of making humanity multiplanetary. We were also informed of a few mission details, like how their Starship will, like HLS, need to dock with a fuel depot in low Earth orbit before making the approximately week-long journey to the moon, coming within 200 clicks of the lunar surface before figure-aiding it back to Earth. This mission will take place after Starship's first manned launch to Earth orbit with the Polaris program and first lunar orbit for MZ's dear moon. There are still 10 seats available for this flight if any millionaires watching are interested. And I am available if any of you need a wingman. But we'll all need to manage our expectations, though, given the current state of world affairs. Since last week's episode, Elon has concurred with my position that if the nukes start flying, it's safe to say that all bets are off. Of course, referring to the Russia-Ukraine proxy war and how it's quickly escalating to World War III. You just got jammed. After the conflict began early this year, SpaceX sent thousands of Starlink terminals into Ukraine at their request to help with communications while fighting back Russian invasion. But word in the papers is that's no longer enough for Ukraine's defense ministry, who went from requesting to expecting, even after the country's leaders attacked Elon for his previous plan to peace. Retro jammed. Ian Brimmer reporting that he spoke with Elon and that SpaceX had Starlink services over Crimea cut off because, well, Crimea is held by the Russians. And operating there risks further escalating the war with a nuclear power that threatens to use them. This would seem to support Elon's previous classified remarks from last week, but Elon also told the Pentagon that SpaceX can no longer afford to continue supporting its operations in Ukraine unless the US military chips in. In addition to terminals, we have to create, launch, maintain, and replenish satellites and ground stations and pay telecommunications for access to internet via gateways. We've also had to defend against cyber attacks and jamming, which are getting harder. The company is burning about 20 million a month. You just got jammed. Again, this comes just days after Ukraine's ambassador to Germany told Elon to take his peace plan and fuck off. So we're just following his recommendation. You got jammed by your own team. Self-jam. However, Elon does deny speaking directly with Putin to find a way to peace. Ian said, Elon said, Putin said, he would use nuclear weapons if Ukraine tried to retake the Crimean Peninsula. This unproven hearsay conversation between Elon and Putin, of course, has the Ukraine sims calling for Elon's head. 
Literally, they want to hang him with the Logan Act. If that sounds familiar, it's because these same psychos try to do the same ridiculous thing to Trump officials. Lest we forget, Elon at one time wanted to take Putin on in single combat. I don't remember any soy boys offering. They won't even fight in the war that they're advocating for. Ian said he admires Elon, but that Musk isn't an expert in geopolitics. Yes, like the experts who made COVID worse, the economy worse, and global energy worse, we should definitely keep listening to the experts that got us into this mess and continue to push us down the path to annihilation. I have spoken to Putin only once and that was about 18 months ago. The subject matter was space. Despite the fog of war, some in Ukraine are still showing their gratitude for what Musk has done, but it's probably best Elon calls ahead first if he ever plans on visiting the region. Speaking of places, Japan has become the first country in Asia to receive Starlink service. And Elon is considering changing the name of Starlink RV, which now has over 100,000 customers, because it's basically just Starlink with roaming capabilities. You can take your terminal anywhere. Well, there you go. Starlink anywhere. Or Starlink Earth. I'll bill you. On Saturday evening, a couple Intelsat geocommunication satellites were launched to geosynchronous transfer orbit from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. And lift off of Falcon 9. Go Falcon, go Intelsat Galaxy 33 and 34. I told you in advance to join me for this live stream because these sunset views provide awesome shots as the sun's rays highlight the rocket in the upper regions of the atmosphere. Here's a nice tracking view of fairing separation, and better still, a continuous shot from the shortfall gravitas deck from launch to landing, a first of its kind view for us. Check out this space jellyfish. This was a record tying 14th mission for this booster, and the first time a booster with over 10 flights was used by a customer and the payloads were deployed successfully. Before we continue, do you know who does support this show as a sponsor? A real sponsor? The Epic Times. America's fastest growing independent news media. They provide truthful news without the influence of any government, corporation, or political party, as well as original Epic TV programs and award-winning documentaries. You like science? They got science. Do you like sports? Easy, they got you. Like art more? They got you, dog. Business and marketing? Bro, they're all over that. Whatever you're into, they probably got it covered. So treat yourself and get you some of this epic action. We think you like it. And I have a special offer for you, my loyal viewers. One dollar for two months. So go to epictim.es slash space eccentric and subscribe. There's a link below in the description. Just moments ago, Crew 4 ended their nearly six month stay at the International Space Station, undocking and performing a deorbit burn to drop them into Earth's atmosphere, which will happen this afternoon around quarter till five Eastern time. We'll stream live for the shoots on Rumble. So join us over there and support the freedom effort. And speaking of Dragon, the crew of Polaris Dawn recently shared their experience writing the Vomit Comet. And it's been some time since Tom Cruise has been a topic of discussion on this show. If you're unfamiliar, before the pandemic, Maverick was making plans to ride on the first Axiom mission to the space station, but obviously he ended up not being on it. I've been fortunate enough to actually be fitted for a suit uh, years ago. But this week it was reported by the BBC that Donna Langley, chairman of Universal, wants to take the reins on this film and send old Tommy to space on Dragon for a space-based action thriller. We are creating thousands of jobs, you The movie outline begins on Earth, but has Tom Cruise into the ISS where the Down on His Luck characters arc requires he walk in space to save the planet. So this trip probably won't happen anytime soon since NASA is not authorizing spacewalks for Acts 2 and 3 ending in 2024. The flick is still in development stages anyway, and not yet greenlit by the studio. Concerning Falcon missions closer to the here and meow, last Friday I received an email from SpaceX concerning their next Falcon Heavy mission. After delays with the payload, USS F-44 is currently go for liftoff from LC-39A at the end of the month, possibly Halloween. It's been many a year, over three to be specific, since the last Falcon Heavy launch, so get pumped dudes. But before that, there is the Falcon 9 launch of Hotbird. Slated for liftoff from Slick 40 at 11.26 p.m. Eastern Time tonight, which would be Friday in case you're watching this over the weekend. Sorry you missed it, unless they scrubbed. Udelsat's Hotbird 13F is a geostationary communication satellite. Well, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for stopping by and catching up. Thumbs up for my supporters on Locals, keeping the dream alive and videos flowing. But everyone, please have a nominal weekend. Until next time, Godspeed. Godspeed.